Okay, good morning. Commissioner Ed Rothstein, I know it's October, it's October 6th, wow. Uh, hopefully those that um, observe Yom Kippur had an easy and healthy fast uh, yesterday and a good start to the uh, new year. Um, as we always do, let's uh, stand for Pledge of Allegiance and a moment of silence. Pledge of allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible. Liberty is justice for all. Okay. Still thinking about Ian, and I think it's up to 120 now confirmed that have passed in Florida because of Hurricane Ian. Um, so let's just keep the men, women, children, and families, friends and family in our thoughts um, as they're going through that horrible time. Um, let's start off with Priority Carol, uh, Commissioner Frazier. <laughs> well, I'd say don't have a lot. I was kind of rushed getting here. But anyway, the other things I really want to talk about Last year, we had a very, very mild flu season. I think it had to do with the people staying away and wearing masks and that kind of thing. Everything is opened up now, and I'm happy for that. But think about getting the flu shot. If you get it this month, it'll really protect you when the flu is in full swing. And also, if you need to get a COVID booster, get one of those so everyone's protected for this upcoming uh, flu and, and you know cold season that, that's coming up. That's all I have. Okay. Commissioner Weaver. Uh, well, I think we've spent the last two days here in the county uh, working on our credit review to keep our bond ratings hopefully a trip away. Uh, it's been interesting two days, and I do want to thank our staff for putting together fantastic packages. And this is where we uh, get a lower interest rate on the bonds we, we sell, and uh, hopefully we can keep this trip away rating that has been, I, th I think, uh, amazing in Carroll County. I think there's 50 counties in the uh, United States that have that bond rating out of what, 1,100 counties or something like that. It's unbelievable uh, that we're able to be that strong. And when you look at us financially, we are. Carroll County is in a very good place. And this morning, I know we're a little bit late, but we had the chance to uh, attend the Chamber of Commerce and Audubon Bosu. Uh, uh, economist uh, give us forecast for the future and it was interesting to say the least uh, he is uh, amazing as far as what he uh, gave us but um, I think our outlook is still good despite what he uh, said we do have some rising inflation and next year is going to be challenging but I think uh, uh, it, it was interesting to hear somebody that has that much research and time into it giving us their forecast so that's all I have for today okay thank you Commissioner Boucher Thank you. Good morning. Uh, sorry for being tardy. I was caught up in Audubon Basu speaking. Economy is a nerdy subject, but as a public official, it's so vitally important that we all understand the economy and what's coming as we set our budgets. As always, it's an honor to talk about things going on in the county. We have walk in the park. The next walk is October 18th. It's a Halloween-themed walk. We're encouraging everyone to get dressed up in costumes to come out and walk. Uh, there will be the Story Trail out there in Hampstead, which is a wonderful program where the library teams off Wreck and Parks, and they set up little pages of the story throughout the trail. So hopefully we'll have some children out there. We'll have representatives from the library. It's going to be very festive. I will be dressed up. I won't tell you what I'm dressing up as. And there'll be photos, and we'll get it up on the website. So please encourage everyone to go out there and walk in the park. I would like to welcome on new employees to the county. We have Cameron Brook. GIS Analyst, 911 Services, Public Safety, Sarah Kolowski, Office Associate, Land Resource Management, our new uh, Director of Human Resources, Chrissy Bixler, Kyle Thornton, Public Safety Technician, Amy Booker, Court Assignment Officer, Delilah Grant, Sheriff Recruitment, Kathleen Meadows, Sheriff Recruitment, Chester Riley, Apprentice Operator and Utilities, Dave Westbrook, fire inspector, permits and inspection, 
Christopher Dorman, uh, apprentice operator, Dylan Moore, correctional deputy detention center, Devon Patrick, deputy first class, Byron Reamers, deputy first class, and Peter Samelstes, uh, bailiff at the circuit court. It's nice seeing new people come on the sheriff's department. And as always, uh, real quickly, I want to read off some of the events going on with the fire departments. Please show your support to them. There's Westminster Fire Department open house on the 8th. Uh, Winfield Fire Department steam crab sale on the 9th. Manchester Golf Tournament on the 10th. Pleasant Valley Crab Feed on the 15th. Manchester Gun Bingo, that's always exciting here in Carroll County at the Manchester Activities Building. Gamber Fire Department Gun Bingo on the 15th. Reese Breakfast on the 16th. Winfield Fire Department Spaghetti Dinner, that's always a blast on the 19th. And the Winfield Fall Harvest Festival on the 22nd. Reese Fire Department will have a shrimp fall shrimp drive through on the 22nd. Reese Fire Department will also have their weekly club banquet on November 5th. And the Winfield Fire Department All Day Bingo, which my mother loves, on the 5th of November. Unibridge Fire Department Cash Bingo Banquet on the 19th of November. And the Reese Fire Department Breakfast on November, uh, yeah, November 20th. Please patronize all of our fire departments. They need your help. After all, the pandemic put a big impact on their receivables and fundraising. And with that, I'll close. Thank you very much. Okay. Um, not sure what's nerdy about economics. I have a master's in it, so uh, don't find myself too much of a nerd. But um, Anna Bambasu and um, the chamber did a great job in sharing um, where Carroll County is, uh, the state of Maryland, and uh, the country, um, and really came down to uh, things that we can influence and things that are just nice to be aware of. Um, the biggest takeaway I got is to um, shop local and take advantage of main streets and keep our communities vibrant because those are things that we can control uh, most of all. Um, really proud of the team, the uh, government team that put together the bond rating, um, you know, with the three financial institutions uh, that came down from New York City. Uh, and I think all three left with uh, a full stomach from the great food in Carroll County, along with uh, a great understanding, or a wonderful understanding, excuse me, of uh, where the county stands um, financially, and uh, you know where where our outlook is. Um, a lot of I see a lot of uh, firemen and women in front of me. Uh, a lot of discussion about that, and um, you know the uh, importance of moving forward um, deliberately with uh, our fire and EMS. Um, and uh, yeah, they, I think they walked away very, very positive uh, in their approach. The third thing is, which I really enjoyed this. It was uh, 11 Girl Scouts. I was asked to uh, share with them Carroll County government and uh, had them downstairs um, at first. And it was interesting. One of the times they said, what's that building over there? I said, it was the detention center. It's the jail where folks go when they're in trouble. How many people are in there? I'm like, I have no idea. So I call up the sheriff, put him on speakerphone, and uh, he spoke to the Girl Scouts as well, which they just got a kick out of, and uh, so did the parents. Um, but we had a good time. Of course, they wanted a photo. And then, more importantly, don't take yourself so seriously. Do everything you do very seriously. We had a little funny-faced uh, competition going on. So thank you very much, Chris. Always a great opportunity to uh, share what's going on in our community. Um, as I finished off with Fire EMS, I do have a proclamation. Mike, why don't you come on up to the uh, table as I read the Fire Prevention Week of October 9th and 15th, 2022. And if you want others to come on up, yes, it's up to you. Um, Mike Karolenko, representing the professional firefighters, paramedics, um, I've got Rick Baker representing our ESAC and Susan Mott, the uh, first vice president of the CCV. Okay. Why don't you all come on up to the seat? Um, Carol, what's that? Okay. No, no, I apologize to the chairs. I'm sorry. 
<laughs> yes, this way you get to talk in the mics. And let me uh, just put your chair up. Just put your chair up. The proclamation first, and then give it off to you, Mike, and you can facilitate or orchestrate it from there, okay? So, Fire Prevention Week, October 9th through October 15th. Carroll County is committed to ensuring the safety and security of all those living in and visiting our county. And whereas fire is a serious public safety concern, both locally and nationally, and homes are the locations where people are at greatest risk from fire. And whereas home fires caused 2,580 civilian deaths in the United States in 2020, according to the National Fire Prote Protection Association, and fire departments in the United States responded to 356,000 home fires. And whereas working smoke alarms cut the risk of dying in reported home fires in half, smoke alarms sense smoke well, sense smoke well before you can, alerting you to danger in the event of fire in which you may have as little as two minutes to escape safely. And whereas Carroll County residents should be sure everyone in a home understands the sounds of the smoke alarms and knows how to respond. And whereas Carroll County residents who have planned and practice a smoke home fire escape plan are more prepared and will therefore be more likely to survive a fire. And Carroll County residents will make sure their smoke and carbon monoxide alarms meet the needs of all their family members, including those with sensory or physical disabilities. And Carroll County first responders are dedicated to reducing the occurrence of home fires and home fire injuries through prevention and protection education. And Carroll County residents that are responsive to public education measures are better able to take personal steps to increase their safety from fire, especially in their homes. And the 2022 Fire Prevention Week theme, Fire Won't Wait, Plan Your Escape, effectively serves to remind Carroll County it is important to have a f home fire escape plan. Now, therefore, we, the Board of Carroll County Commissioners, do hereby proclaim October 9th through 15th, 2022, as Fire Prevention Week, signed by all of us. I, uh, you know, laughed just a little bit because sometimes when my wife and i know she may be listening sometime has a good meal being prepared the smoke alarm may go off and we'll all say <laughs> mom's cooking but everybody knows what that smoke alarm sounds like um i always thought that and and we do it we change the batteries um when we uh, move the clocks either some people do it then or somebody will do it at halloween you know one or the other but uh is that still a common practice? Well, actually, the technology has changed, and now smoke detectors require a 10-year sealed battery. Okay. So we actually ask you to evaluate your smoke detectors, and if you have the old style, um, pick up one of the new, newer styles, which are 10-year sealed batteries. And so all new residences will have those. No, that's great to know because I don't. It's a C battery, and we yep. change it every year. So that will be d being done uh, today or tomorrow, so thank you. I can that. confirm that I was in Lowe's a couple of weeks ago looking for my uh, replacement and uh, was holding these newfangled things up, wondering oh, yeah. if they would work. But uh, now you don't have to replace it for 10 years. Wow. Okay. That, that's good. Good to know. So, so Mike, why don't you uh, orchestrate us through who we have in front of us? Yes. And um, we have representing, um, I'll go from left to right, representing our career firefighters and paramedics, Michael Karolenko, local 5184. Um, we've got the chairman of our emergency services advisory council, um, Mr. Baker, who uh, will be meeting with you all next week. And uh, Rick's been instrumental in moving the ESAC along, done a lot of work for us, and representing the county, Carroll County Volunteer Emergency Services Association, their first vice president, Susan Mott. And uh, everybody's a partner in this system, and we work together daily. We're in regular contact. and. Uh, moving the system along. Fantastic. And I'll tell you, Susan's very influential as she told me to be somewhere on Friday evening and I will be there because she told me to be there. So, <laughs> very influential woman. Just saying. 
Yes, and so, I'd, I'd also like to comment is the number of fire fatalities nationally in the last 30 years has been cut by more than 50 percent. Wow. And in Carroll County, we're fortunate we have two actually under state ordinances that are in place that protect us and that's number one the smoke detectors that now have to be combination smoke and carbon monoxide because most fire fatalities are caused by high levels of carbon monoxide the other thing is is everything new in carroll county uh, is required to be sprinklered as far as residential structures and we've never had a fire fatality in a sprinklered residential structure in carroll county so um, there's a margin of safety that through good government uh, has been put in place that protects all the citizens. And we're glad to see those numbers go down. And on a daily basis, all 14 of our volunteer companies work with their communities directly with uh, fire prevention and community risk reduction programs to help uh, take those numbers down even further. Uh, so we thank them for all their efforts. Director Robinson, thanks for mentioning the sprinkler system. Commissioner Wance is not here with us today, but I want to give him special recognition for his leadership on that issue. He was out on the forefront of that. There was a lot of public outcry against it. But at the end of the day, the numbers are showing that that was the right thing to do. And I want to give special recognition for him in his absence. Thank you. And it still remains around a dollar ten cents per square foot to sprinkler a residence. And uh, most people buying a new home spend much more than that in flooring upgrades and other <laughs> amenities. <laughs> so Landscaping, all that. Very cost effective. I'd just like to mention, as a former teacher, when I taught at the elementary school level, we always talked about the, this, this week, and the reason that this week is right in October is because it was the time of the Great Chicago Fire. But what I learned as a teacher, which I didn't know until I was teaching the stuff, so almost every major city in the United States had a similar event. And that's why they all changed their building codes that were all, you know, wood and to brick or some type of structure that wouldn't burn quite as quite as easily. Yes. So it was a learning experience for me too. But I just, as a teacher, I want to put out there that's why Fire National Fire Prevention Week is in October because of Mrs. O'Leary's cow. Yes, eight, 18, <laughs> se 1872, happen. and that sparked the, the formation of the National Fire Protection Association, who's responsible for all of our codes. It sparked a word next. to be used. What's that? You said sparked. Is that a uh, pun intended? Yes. <laughs> and Sparky's actually part of the <laughs> NFPA. And this year is the 100th anniversary of Fire Prevention Week. Okay. So special initiatives are out there uh, this year because we're celebrating 100 years, the first one being in 1922. Well, were you going to say? No. Well, so I was um, going to mention all that, but you, no, I'm just kidding. Go ahead. <laughs> National Night Out, has it been effective? Um, have you seen, maybe not you, Mike, but others with National Night Out um, events been effective in um, sharing information to the community when it comes to fire? Yes. Yeah, and that's primarily for law enforcement. However, in Carroll County, our law enforcement partners have joined with us mm -hmm. and have invited us there. So we do things with community risk reduction, uh, hands-only CPR, smoking uh, carbon monoxide detectors and whenever we get an opportunity uh, we try to turn it into a fire safety event it's not I'll, I'll mention that it's not just during fire prevention week but it's a year-round program and uh, we hope to uh, enhance that as we start to staff our stations that will be part of their additional duties beyond running calls will be to partner with the volunteer companies to make sure we're getting the message out and over the next uh, several weeks you will see fire engines and other apparatus coming to local schools mm -hmm. and giving their fire prevention talks so it's it's a year-round program but we try to place emphasis during this specific week and we thank you for and, and that's kind of where I was going is what else can we do um, I mean there's 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 several things that we can do um, one of them being is that is is to continue to try to get more formal education programs into the school systems. Mm -hmm. um, I know that they do it. We all go to the different the different elementary schools, preschools, kindergartens to to deliver a message. But I believe it was more structured that it could be something more that could be offered in the school okay. curriculum. It could just be a day, and it's amazing how that interaction with the children when they get that information, they go home and they educate their parents. So I think that's one thing that we can continue to do with that. At the elementary school level? 
it's at, at least start at the elementary school level. Because that's what I remember. I remember, you know, the coloring, you know, uh, stuff like that. Stuff. You know what I mean? Uh, yeah. yep. when, when you're when you were little, and you would bring it home, and you put it on a refrigerator, and then we'd all practice, you know. Well, the children inside would, the lines. Huh? Did you no. color inside lines? No, no. Adults <laughs> Children, when they get scared, I mean, what, what are they going to do? They go hide. They go hide under the bed. They go right. hide in a closet. Right. You know, so right. it's so what I know what we all try to do is to, and, and when you have all the gear on, you have your breathing apparatus on, you're going through a house, you sound like a monster. I mean, you know, you're, you're, you sound mm -hmm. like um, Darth Vader. Vader. Jones. Yeah, yeah, Darth Vader. So, so it is, it, it does help with the education when right. you get that young uh, to hit them early with that. And also to sit with them to practice home fire drills. You know, and everybody guilty. wants to be a firefighter. Yes. We hope that's true, Roberta, here in the next couple Has, of weeks. Um, we want them to become paramedics. Yeah. Also. <laughs> so just curious, do you get the opportunity to present this to the Board of Education and CCPS? I mean, even, you know, there's a lot of public comments that we've been seeing. This would be a really strong public comment uh, or get it on the agenda mm -hmm. for one of their meetings for this long five minutes and saying here is something that can be done in partnership or relation I, I don't know have you done that or yeah, we, ha we haven't done that yet but that that's on our um, strategic plan, strategic okay. plan. it's actually mentioned and we're addressing that and one of our goals would be to one day uh, Board of Education funded of course would be to have a full-time public educator to look at all the areas of community risk reduction and the other part of the population uh, now that I am one is our senior population um, with the number of um, assisted living facilities that we have. Cooking fires are the number one cause of uh, fires in America. And so we want to start hitting the seniors, particularly those in assisted living facilities mm -hmm. and some of the senior housing, which is very prominent throughout Carroll County. And uh, like I said, that includes myself. So we have to become more cognizant yeah. at that level um, just because of a number of physical changes that correlate into certain abilities, particularly when cooking. So it's a year-round program. One of the things, if I could mention, too, that when the sprinkler law came into effect in Carroll County, I always tried to beat the drum that it was always important to get the public involved into it to so that it would help the homeowners or the businesses or the people who were living in a sprinkler building cut down on their, their risk of loss of life and property. But it also cuts down the life and risk of the firefighters going responding to one of those calls too. We're not having to go into a right. as bad an environment as what we normally would be if it was in a non-sprinkler building. Right. So it significantly helps us can cut down on the risk of our lives um, as as we respond to those type of incidents. And and just to add, with our new modern construction, we now see. Um, houses it used to be we had about 12 minutes from the time of a 911 call for us to get there before the house gets to the point where it's an uncontrolled fire right. now with modern lightweight construction materials we're now seeing that as low as three and a half minutes wow. so it makes the the home escape the smoke and carbon monoxide detectors and residential sprinklers that much more critical today than even uh, 20 years ago I, I know I'm probably going a little off topic I had the fire department when I ran Fort Meade and then I thought it was an eight minute response time um, that they had to have the ability and they partnered with Anne Arundel as you know yep. is that response time still I mean because you just said three and a half minutes yeah I we're mean, now and and it's almost an impossibility to be able to get there quick incredible. enough to do that so that's why we're advocating the sprinklers right and um, wow it's important that we can get our apparatus on the street and at the door as quickly as possible but again the sprinklers are going to be the biggest dynamic in, in making a difference we don't really and most people need to understand if you have homeowners insurance that's going to take care of your structure there's no uh, nothing that's going to replace life and the important thing is and that's where we have an educational component to this we've got to get people to get out of their house not worry about their other valuables but make that escape quickly because of the potential for the fire to escalate to take okay. a moment to go back to the education yeah. uh, carroll county visa has worked with the schools for years on the poster program where the elementary schools and middle schools are given a topic a fire prevention topic right 
can do it artistically and then it's voted on and then they are rewarded for what they do but it is a huge educational opportunity for the kids and for their parents because they helped participate in this yep absolutely agree appreciate the education as we're just recognizing the fire week in this proclamation so anything else let's, photo off. let's do a photo okay hey, whoever wants to get up there you got guys in the background or whatever you want Thank you. Okay, let's move on. Public hearing, Chapter 155, Development and Subdivision of Land, Proposed Code Modification. Good morning, Laura. Good morning. Good morning, Mr. President. This is a uh, public hearing on some proposed revisions to Chapter 155. That is our Subdivision and Development uh, Code. It was uh, this public hearing was advertised in the Carroll County Times and it was publicized on our county website on August the 11th 2022 you heard a staff uh, review of the proposed changes with us as you know is, is uh, Laura Matthias from our Bureau of Development Review and uh, she's here to give us a summary or just answer your questions what whatever the board it's, prefers. it's the Laura Matthias yes okay the, do we need uh, this first and then public comment or us first if you think you need a little uh, a brush up since it was back in August she's, she's ready to go on that or I think it would help so you have a slide deck to share I do Please. thank you perfect thank you mr. Burke so as mr. Burke said we were here back in August we provided a summary and uh, had some discussion with you and then we're directed to proceed to public hearing so Again, I'm just going to review the objectives of these code modifications as well as the key items within those propo that proposal. Okay, And a reminder that the proposal is not changing process. It is not changing the authority of our Planning and Zoning Commission. The primary objectives are clarity and more predictability for people looking at our code. So a recap of that process, which started even before May of 2022, but that's when we started discussions with our um, engineers. The Board of County Commissioners referred to the Planning Commission for them to review. The Planning Commission saw this multiple times. Um, there was discussion and forwarded it to the County Commissioners. And here we are today, August 11th, or we were at August 11th and now we're at October 6th um, for this public hearing. So again, a reminder of the objectives. This chapter of the code 155 is what we're focused on. The title of the chapter is Development and Subdivision of Land. We do have a development review manual, which we are looking to retire and absorb all pertinent information into the code reconfigure chapter 155 to streamline the layout and revise for again clarity and predictability so as we reviewed last time those key items that we're adding most of these are coming from the manual put being put into the code there's an additional um, the last one the road frontage dedication requirements for site plans we have this for subdivisions, but not site plans. We'd like to add this into the code for site plans that are not in the agricultural zoning district. Key items removed. We had previously what we call an ESD, environmental site delineation. 
this for years has already been absorbed into our overall general review process, so there wasn't a need for that redundancy to have it in the code. And then the parking space requirements are proposed to be moved from Chapter 155 as they mostly relate to uses, moving those to Chapter 158, the zoning code, and we are working with Department of Planning as well as our zoning administrator to see where that best fits. And then the one modification, a modification simply to the percentage outlined in the code for what falls under an administrative modification regarding use in common driveways. Is this to um, lessen the opportunities for use in common driveways or? It's to align with the requests that we often see, which is an existing 10 foot wide driveway and the code for use in common requires 12 foot wide. Right. So it would accommodate the most frequent request that we get and instead of having to go before the full planning commission, mm -hmm. um, it would be an, an administrative modification per the head of the department in conjunction of course with conversation with all pertinent agencies that would weigh in fire and emergency services, Bureau mm -hmm. of Resource Management, etc. Does the board have any other questions? Are there any questions? Mr. President, at this point, uh, it's appropriate to take any public comment. Do we have any public comment cards received for uh, statements? No. Is there anybody on the phone? Anybody on the phone, Chris? I have no one on the line. Thank you. Anybody out there? <laughs> <laughs> With that, I move the Board of Commissioners leave the public hearing and leave the record open for no less than 10 days. Close second. the public hearing. Close the public hearing. Close we're, the public hearing. Yeah. I'll second the closing. Okay, we got the motion, we got the second. Any discussion? Seeing here, none all in favor? Aye. Aye. Thank you so much, Laura. Thank you all. <laughs> that was very interesting. Okay, um, Carroll County Code of Public Law, Local Laws and ordinances dealing with chapter 37, fire EMS. Mr. President, we have another public hearing today. As you said, it's uh, regarding Mike. chapter 37, which is our new fire and EMS uh, ordinance. Uh, this ordinance was uh, duly advertised in the Carroll County Times, and it was publicized on the county's website at uh, the EMS uh, website. With us here today uh, is uh, Mike Robinson, the uh, director, and he has a uh, short summary of what's being proposed, and it is a little different from uh, from what we started with, but uh, not much different. So, okay. Uh, good morning, commissioners, and uh, obviously, I'm not going to go through line by line. I'll hit the highlights um, since the uh, Ordinance went out for public comment. We again reviewed different things, and uh, there are no substantive changes to what was presented previously. There are some language changes um, that have been made. Um, one of the areas, um, and I'll just go through the sections, is uh, under the director, we propose a change of director slash chief, and that would be consistent with other code language where a department director is identified. Um, for purposes of the code itself and its interaction with other county codes. The title of the individual holding that position would be that of chief to be consistent with the fire and EMS service um, as we had previously discussed. So um, that's one change in there. Um, under the um, same section we have uh, identified uh, the ESAC, the Emergency Services Advisory uh, Council, and we've actually put them in code language, and that was after meeting uh, with ESAC, and uh, that's under Section C of 37.001, which uh, codifies the ESAC and their duties. And this is consistent to the enabling legislation that was passed, I believe, in uh, 2018. Mm -hmm. 
So it actually would codify that and it identifies their bylaws as their operating parameters. That's the other um, area that uh, was placed in there. Um, most of the other areas is um, because we got into some discussion previously about the Fair Labor Standards Act, mm -hmm. um, we have placed in our definitions um, as to what an employee is, and you'll see the number 207K, that comes out of the federal um, statute that identifies those employees with, that are firefighters and EMS that come under the exemption for overtime based on a wage and hour formula. And I know there had been some discussion, and I don't know if there's any comments today on that, but we define that in the code language, and we've also defined a um, non-207K employee. That will be those paramedics that we hire that because they're paramedics, we want to hire them, but they may not have fire training. They come under a different formula where everything after 40 hours, they will get um, overtime at a time and a half rate. So all the other areas, it's just a matter of housekeeping, have been updated uh, to reflect all those other areas. So uh, beyond that, um, there's no substantive changes to the language in the code as was presented. And this has been up uh, for public comment now mm -hmm. for a number of days and available to everyone. So director slash chief, we're referring to you in that, that position? Is that what you're saying? Yes. I don't know. So the, the, the title, in essence, would be Chief Michael Robinson, Director of Fire and EMS. Sounds good to me. Hmm. Are you finished? Yeah, I'm, I'm just thinking about it. Yeah, please. I do have a question on the overtime pay for firefighters. Uh, is this what you're proposing is work in excess of 212 hours within a 28 day period, then they'll, then they'll receive overtime pay, is that correct? Is that what's done everywhere else? Um, every, every, in the other jurisdictions in Maryland, which right now would be Anne Arundel County, Prince George's County, Salisbury, uh, the city of Annapolis, and I believe that, that those are the jurisdictions. They do pay overtime after 212. However, um, each of those jurisdictions and done some research on it, they've all identified that through collective bargaining agreements. And um, currently we have no collective bargaining agreements. Right, but I, I, I would like us to be competitive. Well, I mean, we're trying to hire firefighters in here. I want us to be competitive so we can get people in here. So I'm not, I, I don't think I understood your answer to be honest with you. So everyone else waits to 212 hours before they give overtime pay? Yes. Well, no, actually not. Those other jurisdictions that I just mentioned, um, anything after their, so if they work a 24-hour shift, they're held over for an hour because they get a late call, those other jurisdictions would get time and a half overtime. We'll be paying straight overtime or straight time pay at their regular rate until they cross that threshold of 212 hours in a pay period. All right, Chris. Again, I'm thinking about recruit recruitment, get people in here, because we're going to hire, what, 324 people over the next two years or whatever it's going to be? Two, what? Okay. Yeah, it'll, it, it, but it, anyway, if we want to be competitive, get people in here, I think we have to, I think it has to be better than what it is here. Just my opinion, but I, I would like to hear what the, here in the public, um, you know, public comment, but I just think it has to be better. I, I want, we want to do this, we want to stand up this force, we have to be competitive with the people around us who are trying to hire the exact same, basically, people. We want them to come to Carroll County. I think that's a, I think that's a major issue. And that's just my opinion. I'm not sure if it is or not. I'm not a firefighter. I, I, I personally would like to see that change, but that's just me. You have changed to what? To what the other counties and or cities are doing that after if, if it's 24 hours they work an hour overtime to get the hour overtime at pay and a half i if they're doing that <clears throat> i think we should be doing it well cur currently they would work in a 28-day cycle they would work 168 hours so 
they will have a deficit of 44 hours until they would be eligible for overtime. So it would be after they hit 168 hours, then they would need another 44 hours. Right. That's I, my feeling after the 168 hours, then overtime should start. But just no, right. I understand. I, my challenge is where we were last year with the budget and how difficult it was getting us through, you know, the budget. I, I, I understand. You, you, we put that in place now. I mean, looking at next budget season, it's going to be, it could be catastrophic, the numbers. And that I don't like. Um, I mean, you know, it was hard enough to get the budget to where we got to today, you know, and. I, I do, I do know that, but. I, I think I don't think this is right. Simple but, as that. No, I understand, but I th I think we need to live within our means. I mean, more than we are. If if we put this in place, we'd be so far out. Yeah. Well, potential. We did. We did run some numbers with our budget analyst, and uh, once we were fully staffed, which I'm going to say is going to approach 250. Um, the potential liability is up to about four million dollars but the thing to understand is is it doesn't mean that everyone every pay cycle is going to be getting sure. 44 hours of overtime it right. would be sporadic at best so we don't in, in year one um, it wouldn't be a significant impact but as we grow exponentially it's going to be a significant amount of unfunded liability into the millions of dollars um, so I, I, I agree so if we set the stage now and you know we're trying to forecast our budget out we are going to be i think in a very difficult position but if you're going to wait if you're going to i don't know how this is going to turn out but okay let's say this passes the way it is so you're going to wait until another board comes in to try to make a change to, to this possible i mean i i just don't see that happening well, it, I, I don't see it happening soon anyway the, and, the, and the I, budget yeah I, I know i just the the budget passed as you know three two and it was hard enough to get us there right we put this in place i one i don't want it to be short-lived because it's going to be hard to maintain that budget. I, I think we need to get through the budget before and, and probably amend this if necessary afterwards um that, that that's my thoughts on it i mean i i know what you want to do and i i don't disagree with the the sentiment of it and that's to be competitive you know across the state but i think the 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 cost of it is potentially going to put us in such a i, I think we need position. to see a prediction on this as okay if it goes in this way first year what what's the possible predictions after 250 and what what it cost us i mean I, th I think we do need to see yeah i agree yeah. we yeah. need to see fiscal some fiscal year one and our anticipation now is for the current fiscal year we're probably not going to have everybody in place that's budgeted which will be 88 positions until probably april so we're looking at uh april may and june mm -hmm. so the impact is minimal that first year right and the other thing is we have additional people built into every shift and we're going to have scheduled leave so we have the ability to manage this o over time initially will probably be limited to a late call there's not going to be wholesale overtime available for people working shift work um, by the time we get to year four and we're up to 250 people and we allow four people off per shift out of probably about 54 to 56 people per shift anything beyond that will be overtime because our staffing is at the bottom line we're minimal staffing so one person not coming in because they're sick has an impact but we will have when this is all fully vetted we'll have six people on a shift to oversight to um, offset that so right. until those six people are utilized each day we're not in an overtime situation so yeah, but that, I agree and that makes my argument well I will say let's hear what public comment is yeah it's gonna be open yeah. for 10 days after that we're not making a decision on this today okay. but I would like to see some information on what other the fire companies around us what their overtime costs are be doing it the way that they're doing it that's what I'd like to see okay Go, going back to um Director slash chief, uh, titles do mean something. 
What's that? Kidding, go ahead. Oh, I'm sorry. What? I said going back there again. I'm just kidding. Yeah. yeah. Um, I'm not. I'm not sure why we would be calling you Chief um, as opposed to just Mister. The, you know, and what what's getting me is the administrative control and the operational control. You have the administrative control of running the fire EMS department or directorate for Carroll County. Um, you have the skill set, you know, if first on scene to do the things you need to do. But are there going to be, there, there'll be chiefs at each station, I would imagine, right? There are. Um, I just, I don't know, I, I, I almost take it to, again, it's the military in me, you know. This is, this know. is connected to we have just made an operational chain of command that's been signed off by the volunteers. And in that operational chain of command, it puts the director operationally at the top of the. the so, you will, so you will have operational command? Absolutely, I do now. So it relies on the everyday calls to a volunteer corporate officer. But because of um, Carroll County as a governmental function now has fire and EMS protection. So right. should we have a catastrophic okay. event operationally, okay. I have the ability okay. to come in and assume command of the incident. Okay. So you have both administrative and operational command. Okay, that, <coughs> got it. That's different than where I was going. So yes, yes. got it. Okay, I can uh, I can live with that. That makes that makes perfect sense. Thanks. Public comment. Are you are you done? Yeah. All right. Thank you. I want to go back to the overtime article subsection one. It says the overtime is based on a 28 day cycle. Yes. We pay on a 14-day cycle. We don't. That won't create a problem. Yes. Well, we we looked and we've met with um, the comptroller's office and the payroll, and we looked at a 14-day cycle, which the sheriff uses, which takes it from 212 to 106. Mm -hmm. So the outcomes are essentially the same. So we won't have no difficulty with the payroll or whatever. No, okay. no. And that was my only concern. Thank yes, you. And actually, the VTI system is very robust. It's actually has elements in there that are. Uh, designed around a, a shift schedule as we're going to be using. And thanks for pointing out about the sheriff's department because I was wondering if we all should be on the same page with that. Yes. Thank you. Okay. Um, any other questions? I had one question. I should have asked you yesterday. I forgot. Two oh seven K. That's a reference to the Fair La Labor Standards Act. Yes. All right. Thank you. We probably should flesh that out a little bit when we when we finalize this. Thank you. So, do we have any public comment? Yes. Okay. Uh, the first card I have is uh, Mr. Rick Baker. Thank you. We ask that you uh, please limit your comments to three minutes if possible. Will do, Tim. Thank you. <laughs> uh, my name is Rick Baker and I'm chairman of the Emergency Services Advisory Council. ESEC had the opportunity to review Chapter 37 and I want to provide the following comments. Going through the review process provided another example of the importance of ESEC as we continue to develop and implement the Department of Fire and EMS for the county. ESAC worked with county government to include the wording and recognized ESAC as a participant and its function in Chapter 37. The second comment is a potential recruitment and retention concern that ESAC discussed at our September meeting. Employees that are classified as 207K employees will not be compensated for overtime for the first 44 hours worked after their 42 hour work week. ESAC understands that this is within the law for this classification of employees. However, we want to address this as a potential issue since other neighboring county fire departments do not use this practice. We could in the future train new employees and lose them to other counties. Now, I'm not talking about in the near term, but I'm looking future down four and five years down the Ryan when we start having our own academy classes and things like that. Thank you for your time to provide comments, and ESAC looks forward to continuing our advising and teaming efforts and a joint meeting on October 11th. Thank you. Thank you. Sorry. Uh, <laughs> I forgot I had the cards. Forgive me. Verna Karolinko. She's waiting for you to use your three minutes. I know. <laughs> I never started. We were shocked. <laughs> okay. I appreciate it. Good morning. Good morning, commissioners. My name is Verna Karolinko. I've been a resident of, <clears throat> excuse me, Carroll County for 37 years. I'm here this morning to comment on proposed amendments to Chapter 37 
which establishes a countywide fire EMS system for Carroll County. First, as a citizen and mother of two first responders, it is appalling to me that the proposed death benefit for a fire or EMS responder killed in the line of duty is a one-time payment of one month's salary. In dollars, this would equate roughly $4,800 to $5,500. The IRS classifies a $50,000 death benefit to employees a de minimis benefit, meaning it is so insignificant that it does not trigger taxable compensation. I also strongly disagree with the 12-month waiting period for new hires during which this benefit would not be available. Secondly, applying overtime standards that deny overtime premiums for excessive work hours violates the intention of the Fair Labor Standards Act. When the FLSA was enacted in 1938, it was to protect employees from exploitation. This is an issue of ethics, not just because not just because you can do something doesn't mean you should do something. And Carroll, Carroll County's fire and EMS employees should have overtime pay standards similar to the Sheriff's Department, other Carroll County employees, and neighboring county systems. Third, I surveyed households in Finksburg, and overwhelmingly residents agreed that they are willing to pay additional real estate taxes to fund the Carroll County Fire and EMS Department. Only one person objected to an increase in real estate tax. She thought it should be an income tax. Finally, the commissioners have been debating and delaying the implementation of the Carroll County Fire and EMS system for years. From the time of the initial projected start date of July 1, 2021 until now, you have cost this county many highly qualified responders lost to other departments. You are at risk of losing more unless you act on this program immediately. Thank you. Thank you. Ryan Dyson. Good morning, Mr. Commissioners. I just wanted to say that we really need to move forward with this. Um, with the, what you've heard about the death benefits and the 207K exemptions, just put it in perspective, you're supposed to get off at 7 a.m you get held over on a shift that you're not scheduled to work and you have to cancel plans with your family and everything, you're not getting any extra compensation other than your normal, normal salary. You don't get that time and a half benefit that you would be in other ways. But less trained people who are EMS only would get that time and a half if they work over 40 hours. I, I just don't see that fairness there. Um, the sheriff's office, if they work over their scheduled shifts, they make time and a half. Thank you. Thanks, Brian. Mike Karolinko. You got mom involved, so <laughs> this shouldn't be as bad, hopefully. So, excuse me one second. My name is Michael Karolinko. I'm a county resident, uh, a homeowner, a taxpayer, a career member of the fire and EMS system in Carroll County and president of the Carroll County Professional Firefighters and Paramedics. I just want to briefly say before I get back into this and I'd ask your, your leniency real quick. Uh, so as far as the overtime goes, the four, $4 million was done by taking 44 hours times 400 and 240 employees and then timesing that by our overtime rate. That, in, that $4 million would say that our overtime budget as a whole being that additional half-time liability would be $12 million. It's not realistic, and it's not what our overtime budget's gonna be. When you actually take the maximum amount of time that an employee can take off in the course of a year, times the difference on their overtime rate, it actually comes out to, an, and then also realizing we have floaters built into the system, and we already have budgeted overtime money built into what you've already assigned to us. In the third year, the maximum impact that it would have on our system is $390,000. That's saying everybody took every bit of time they have. So, you know, how many times have we sat up here in the last months and you've approved something for $400,000? I mean, this isn't far less, maybe significant in my mind, than staffing fire apparatus when people need it. So I appreciate your latitude, just me getting through this. I, I'm sorry if I go over by a little bit. The vast majority of the amendments to Chapter 37 take the heed of the lessons learned by the departments who have transitioned before us. They take the successes and best practices of those departments and combine them to build out a competitive department of our own. 
These amendments establish fair practices for much needed time off, transfers, promotions, professional development, and address potentially unfair scenarios. Chapter 37 has done more than a fair job ensuring those things are present, although many of these practices are far into typical county employment in Carroll County. We stand in support of that our departmental leader will be given the respect and legitimacy of the title of chief. This is common practice among every fire, county fire department in the surrounding area. Just as the volunteers are led by their company chiefs, we look forward to the simple and straightforward recognition of the departmental chief that we will work for. We urge the commissioners to reevaluate the practice proposed to exploit the FLSA 207K overtime exemptions. As it, is, as it is written, we will have to work 44 additional hours in a 28-day cycle before receiving time and a half compensation. No other county employee is treated this way, not even the sheriff's deputies who also fall under the 207K. Other jurisdictions have had to correct this error after great injury to morale, operational readiness, staffing, and employee retention. Why repeat the lessons they already learned? Coming home from my shift yesterday while speaking to a friend and colleague, I contemplated the gut-wrenching thought that due to my job, I may not be able to make this ride home one day. Chapter 37 currently says that my family would receive just one month worth of pay if I was killed in the line of duty. If the answer is that's county practice, how could this considered be even considered morally adequate to take care of my family if in the process of serving these communities, I was no longer present to do so? This is not a scenario of workers comp time off or an early retirement. This is me dying and Trisha, Colby, Ben, and Lucy attempting to survive and not lose our home, our house in the process. Ultimately, we do stand in support of the commissioners expeditiously adopting these amendments in Chapter 37, obviously with the, the concerns at hand. We stand in support of fair, moral, and ethical treatment of those who will serve the department, and we are ready to see this transition move forward as quickly as responsibly possible. Thank you. Oh, thank you, Mike. And the last card I have is uh, Dennis Beard. Last but definitely not least. Good morning. Um, I stood in this building January of 1979 at a public hearing conducted by Delegate Harkenhorn, Delegate Beck, and State Senator Charles Smeltzer. And the issue was fire and EMS. And here it is today. We're still kicking this can down the road. I support most of what Chief Robinson and ESAC has put together. I've got some concerns. But it's time that we move forward I got to give you folks credit you've done something that a lot of your predecessors hasn't done I was fortunate when I moved to Carroll County to get picked up by a neighboring jurisdiction that neighboring jurisdiction this past year celebrated their 50th anniversary as a combination department. And today, the citizens of Howard County are being protected, not only by their volunteers, but a staffing of four people on all engines, medic and an EMT on ambulances, and aerial devices with four people. It's time for Carroll County to move forward. Thank you for your time. Okay, thank you, sir. Anyone else? That's all what? I had. I don't, I don't. Chris, is there anyone on the phone? No one on the line, sir. Okay. I'd like to ask a question. Yeah, please. What is the death benefit for a sheriff's deputy that gets uh, killed in line of duty? Can we ha get that information? We don't. Uh, if you don't have it now, I'd just like to have it. We, we can find out. Yeah, I'd just like to have that. Mm -hmm. And uh, and it's just a comment as well. Mm -hmm. I think we're moving 
as quickly forward with this as we as we can. We want to make sure everything is done properly before the documentation is signed and before it goes forward. I don't want to just throw something together, put it out there. It has to be change, 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 change. It might seem like it's taken a while, but I think we're doing it the right way. And we are moving, at least in my opinion, from sitting up here as quickly as we can to get this done. We really are. I, it might not seem that way from the outside, but we are moving quick. And I, I just appreciate your indulgence in that. That's yeah. all I have. No, I was about to say the same thing uh, with the ESAC, with the community, with Mike, you coming on board, getting the right leadership uh, into our team. Uh, I think it's been critical. Um, and uh, yeah, I, I'm very proud. I'm very, very proud of the uh, comments made. Um, some more difficult than others to, you know, to look at, but we need to address them all. Um, sometimes the answer is no, but you know, can only get to know if you put everything on the table and willing to put it on the table. And that's what I appreciate with the communities. Get it on the table, have the discussion, and either come up with a, a understanding and a yes or an understanding and a no, or a, we will continue to wait and see. Um, so, no, I, I definitely appreciate these comments. Are there any other just comments. <coughs> comments were uh, greatly appreciated. I did realize we had a couple glitches there I wasn't totally aware of, but now's the time to air them. And in your comments, yes, we are moving ahead. I know it's slow. Commissioner Fraser, I hate to say, is right, but we are trying to do it correctly. We're trying to get through this, and I guarantee this should be happening very shortly. Yes, thank you. Yeah, I appreciate everyone's patience. You know, if you don't do something right, it's important to take the time. And even as we go into this, we'll find these little glitches taking place. Two things that are of concern to me is the overtime issue. The cycle doesn't match up with the sheriff's department. I find that a little bit disturbing. And another thing that I find extremely disturbing is the death benefit. I would like to see the next board look deeper into this about possibly doing some self-insurance program where members of EMS could actually contribute to it. We do self-insure for our health insurance, and I think there's a model and a template out there that hopefully the next board could look into us further since we're coming to an inter air term, maybe set up some potential seed money in the fund. I'd like to see it, someone at least receive their full year salary to their spouse survivor, something of that nature. I'll take some research, but that that is critical. Mr. Karlenko made a very good point about they're going out there risking their lives every day. Every day you step out there on a the call, you have no idea whether they're gonna come back and that your family needs a reassurance that there's more than just a month's salary coming to them if their spouse is lost. So I hope that we can plant the seed as we go through this for the next board to evaluate and review it and make some adjustments. But I want you to know that we are paying attention to these issues and we have listened, so thank you. I, uh, I do appreciate your comments, Commissioner, but I would like this board to get this done. I would like to have this done before I'm out of office here, and I think everybody out there would like to see it done as quickly as possible. I don't. And I'm not saying hold it up. No, I, I just I'm review I, it in the future if there's. Well, any. they can review. Yeah, I don't. Yes, they can exactly. review it, but let's get this done before this board is out of, is right. out of office. Hopefully, I won't even put a timeline on it, but hopefully soon. I just say that. Yeah, hope is not a course of action. Let's get it done. And you said next board at least three times, and this is not for next board. This is for us yes, to continue. Exactly what you said, Mr. Beard. You know, let's keep the momentum going. ESAC has done a great job getting us to where we want to go. You have led a really good job, and we should not be holding this up for no. other five guys to make another decision to push it down further. No, this needs to be done. And uh, so... What I want to do is, you know, close this, keep uh, close this, keep the record open for 10 days at this time. That's my motion. Second. I got a motion. I got a couple of seconds. Is there further discussion? Yes. I want to clarify that I in no way was trying to delay, delay this action. I just want to make sure that the next board keeps an eye on this and rectifies any glitches that do potentially come up. Thank you. Okay. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Thank you. Thank you. Text amendment to the Employment Campus District to allow 
solar energy conversion facilities. I take it, Ms. Linda, somewhere. Clear room here. I know. Linda, just push right through them. You can knock them over. <laughs> yeah. Again, Shana Tova, hopefully you had an easy fast. It was meaningful. Okay. <laughs> Good morning. So we are here before you to request a public hearing for um, the Employment Campus District. Whoops, wrong presentation. I apologize. There we go. Um, we came before you back over the summer to um, explore the possibility of allowing solar energy conversion facilities on land zone for employment campus. Um, the purpose of this is for expanding the county's solar energy portfolio on suitable land. Um, currently, this is not a primary use allowed on employment campus zone land. So the proposal before you would be for a conditional use approval with various size limitations, which we've outlined um, in the text on these lands. This amendment request was forwarded to the Planning Commission, and they reviewed these proposed changes at their August 16th and September 20th meeting. And they forwarded it back to you all with a favorable recommendation, and today we're asked to go to public hearing um, and tentatively scheduled for November 3rd. So what was sent to Planning Commission, they reviewed um, over the course of these two meetings. And again, it's for the allowance of ground mounted solar energy conversion as a standalone separate type of use, um, not roof mounted or part of a parking structure that's already currently allowed. So the proposal is for ground mounted, which is the additional added language um, the underlined, as you can see here on the slide separate from the development plan pending a conditional use approval we worked with public works scott graff and jason green they're the ones that are working with the solar companies to move these projects forward um, and the ground mounted solar field so the actual energy conversion portion would be no more than 25 acres in size um, planning commission and uh, the public works team felt it was important to not have these uh, go beyond that it's not necessary um, in size and not to exceed 50% of the total gross acreage of the land itself or whatever is lesser. So again, 25 would be the max, but looking mm -hmm. if there's smaller lands, it still wouldn't be engulfing um, more than half the property itself. Currently, roof mounted solar energy is allowed and may be approved as part of the development plan subject to the requirements of 158 or mounted on a canopy of the parking area. And that's already currently allowed. But this is the section that this would be inserted. Hold on for a second. On your, yeah, go ahead. Your statement here if it says ground mounted solar field may be no more than 25 acres in size, not to exceed 50% of total gross acre, you don't need to say or whatever is less because it already tells you exactly how much you can have. I did, that just doesn't seem that that whatever's lesser doesn't seem to make sense to me oh. it's either 25 acres up to 50 percent that's what that says to me it can't be more than 25 acres can't be more than 50 percent it's already there it just that uh, uh, whatever is lesser just doesn't make sense my, my question is a little bit more I, I i understand where you're going but i think it's a little bit more narrow is why say 25 acres and not just uh, no more than 50%. Because if we're looking at a very large employment campus, um, you know, I understand we don't want it to be so, but I, I just, I'm not sure why we're restricting one, one way or the other. We either say 25, no more than 25 acres, uh, you know, or the, the 50%. Yeah. Yeah, I think the key point is the the um, use of the property is for employment campus. So we didn't want to take away from that and have have a 200 acre employment campus become a solar, a large scale solar facility. So we want to still. It'd only be a hundred acre solar facility. I'm just kidding. No, but if it's two hundred, <laughs> but if it's a 400 acre employment campus, then why not have a 200 acre solar field? Around? Well. I think again the main goal is to keep it in as much of it employment campus as possible so if you have a 400 acre property and 200 acres is employment campus and 200 acres is is solar you're taking away from that other uh, potentially available property to use for employment campus 
okay, so I can buy all that, then why make this conditional and not um, permissible? If we go with, with this type of language, which is very Just again, specific. to have more additional guardrails. So that conditional use approval has to go to the Board of Zoning Appeals, um, again, for just that another eye and to have the public aware that this is um, different than what the primary principal use is. Can this be combination rooftop and ground mount? Mm -hmm. This is just specifically for the provisions you have the ground mounted as a separate standalone use. It does not have to be part of any built structures on the employment campus. And how many employment campuses do we have p could be out there right now? Currently zoned in the county, mm -hmm. we only have one. Mm -hmm. That's uh, actually, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take that back. We have two. Mm -hmm. One, a small property um, in Westminster to the north west of the landfill and then the other um is a delaney. property known as the delaney property which mm -hmm. is north of century and linton springs and that's just like a little over 100 acres i, I didn't think we have much for no that's we it. don't have much of this type of land and that does limit you know we do need employment campus uh, mm -hmm. i do like the idea of employment campuses mm -hmm. if they can use this in a combination of like rooftop and yep. land uh and and ca solar canopy on parking as well this was just another way to really for the employment campus eke out land that wasn't 100 percent usable for the built structures of the employment campus to have a full more full utilization of the land itself so, so that, what recommend that, that they go into yeah. uh you know rooftop a lot of this into rooftop and um parking lot if they so choose if the developer so chooses to do that so why not put um boundaries on eking out space why not say that it is permissible on space within the uh, employment campus you know defined space that's not um eligible or buildable, cap buildable for whatever i i just and, and you know this i don't like conditional i i just i you know we're, we're going through two conditional issues right now down in um in eldersburg and it, it's very concerning because planning commission will say one thing, it goes to the BZA, and it's becoming this very um, tense. Um, I, I'd rather it either be not allowed or allowed, or if it is allowed, or if it is conditional, like in this way, what can be defined within the property that if it's not able to be used for you know commercial industrial use why not just put, allow solar i don't know i like the idea of just making allowable our a primary use of conditional i do like that idea but i don't like the idea of saying it can only be put on property that can't be built upon no i don't like that idea at all if you're going to if you make it uh primary use i'm good with that okay not to exceed to 25 acres or 50 percent that's all good i like that so Take just, off that just a request to go to public hearing so yeah i know okay, i know all right okay. just want to make no, sure no, so we're, we wouldn't be changing the legislations out there so what we would do if you go to public hearing with this or if you want to send it back to planning commission which i don't right. know if that's no. necessarily what no. you would okay i do uh, like conditional use that keeps it is employment campus is primary that's what it's intended for and you can if you each one's different then you go to the conditional use because of environmental issues or whatever that we can't build on this but we can put solar panels uh, well let's send it to public hearing see what the comments are and then we can talk about it after yeah. we hear, hear the hey, comment I mean, period i agree but it is good to have the conversation yeah, to hear is. the sentiment for the for the community right. to know what we're thinking i just um i, I i'm taking right. every um you know uh comment that's provided to me on those two properties down in um in eldersburg uh, very seriously about it going from planning to busy and we know this and it's it becomes very contentious when things are conditional in the sense that it's either recommended or not recommended right. and then it goes to BZA. So, so just all to right. be clear though on so that case that was not based on a conditional use approval at all the it, one that was it was boarded. based so not, on not to get in and speaking about that case okay but, but it was not based on a conditional use just so you know it was based on not having an available, you know, no, parking. No, I, I don't want to get into okay. the Okay, no, no problem. Just, so, just okay. to be clear, it okay. was not a conditional okay. use issue. And planning okay. Commission doesn't see conditional use. Yes. Only the Board of Zoning Appeals. Okay, I got so. it. 
I know I know what you're saying. Okay, got it. So, but this is going to we can close this and keep it open for 10 days. No, no, no. We're no, no. Going to go to make the motion that oh, request is yeah. to go to public hearing on right. this. Um, the other part that would need to also <laughs> public hearing on the brain. Yeah. yeah. After two Sorry. of them. Sorry, these are requests uh, for public right. hearing. Okay. The second part would then to um to update uh, so what 158.153, what is a solar energy generating system, um, and to allow um, to allow them as a conditional use in the employment campus district, and to have a size limitation, um, again on them, and that just reaffirms it in this specific section as well. So again, the request is to go to public hearing. We're looking at November 3rd um, for adoption of dis um, adoption. I'm sorry, discussion decision on November 17th, and then the new code changes would take effect 10 days after that. Okay, I'll make the motion, Board of Commissioners. Yeah. Move this to public hearing on the proposed text amendment for the uh, EC district as recommended by Planning Zoning Commission. Second. Okay, I got a motion. I got a second. Any discussion? Seen here none. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay. Thanks, and apologize for that confusion. Um, it's been that kind of morning. That's all good. So are we talking text amendment? Yep, so one more text amendment. I um, want to see three. Uh, so the text amendment, for, um, the next text amendment for your consideration to go to public hearing is um, amendments to the I-1 district and the C-3 district. And there are multiple requests to this amendment that were brought forward. Um, this was referred uh, by, referred to the Planning Commission by this body on August 4th. Mm -hmm. They discussed this at their August and September Planning Commission meetings, and they referred back to you um, a favorable recommendation on September 20th, at their September 20th meeting. So, it's a very um, lengthy text amendment to two districts that's fairly nuanced. Um, the first is specifically for the business industrial park. These changes, again, as you all know, this is how you sent it to Planning Commission, um, was for business industrial park only in the I-1 district, and there's only one area in the county that falls under the business industrial park. Um, those had to be um, developed as of April 1 of 2019, and we only had one at the time. So keeping that moving forward, um, it was grandfathered in that particular property. Mm -hmm. So the request specifically pertains to this part of the code, um, and the request is to add a business industrial park definition. That was not done because we were moving away from those, so um, more of a cleanup is to go back and just add that definition. Um, the change from what's currently allowed to what the request is for a new allowance is to add um, self-storage facilities to the business slash industrial park and then to um, modify the parking requirements for self-storage in the park and modify sign requirements. And I'll go over where I have the legislation too. Mm -hmm. um, the next for the business park and the business industrial park, so a business park is found in the commercial um, high district and then the business industrial park is only found in the I-1 district, um, is allow the yards on both sides of an interior lot line may be zero, and the planning commission may reduce other yard requirements. And then where this zero yard is proposed internal to the structure, um, setbacks, buffers, or landscape screening requirements shall not be applicable. So again, that's internal to the park itself, uh, not to the buffer requirements that are required perimeters of properties and that would be new the next um, within the industrial park which is currently in the I-1 district would be to increase the retail size allowance currently it's 10,000 square feet for retail in that park to move it to 25,000 square feet then to allow medical and dental without limita limitations. So currently within the industrial park, those uses have a percentage limitation on the entire park. Um, so the request is to allow without those limitations. So they would not be as part of the equation of the um, commercial versus industrial balance in that industrial park. Um, again, to allow these parks to be subdivided. This was a concern of mainly to do with how these types of parks are financed, especially when they can um, finance them in se smaller sections as opposed to one big financing. Um, and then to modify 
parking regulations um, to actually create standards. We don't have parking regulation standards currently for these industrial parks specifically. Um, we did see one come through last at our last planning commission meeting that had to, because there is no formula standard had to take each different use and apply the parking standard that's a that is required for each use and, and come up with this uh, mathematical formula essentially to figure out what the general parking standards would be so that makes it a little more complex than it needs to be Linda, why, why do we have limitations on uh, dental and medical facilities only within the parks because the idea with the industrial or the slash the uh, parks were that the industrial park would allow some flexibility to have more commercial type uses but we did not want those parks to become all commercial because the idea is to keep them more industrial and the commercial is supposed to be more supportive of the industrial uses so that's why those limitations were set when you all reviewed and adopted those changes to the I-1 district um, in 2020. And again, the same for the commercial parks. So the commercial parks allow for some industrial, but did not have so much so that it would change it from that commercial nature to a more industrial nature. Okay. Again, all we're doing is moving this to public hearing. We're only moving this to right. public hearing. <laughs> I could talk about a couple of things I don't like in here, yep. but I will do it right on now. On November 3rd, again, would be the request. No. And then, um, again, for discussion decision on the 17th. Um, these code changes are on our website under the Department of Planning. Um, so at carolrezoning.org. All right. It, if I may ask Ms. Eisenberg, the yes. 2.3 parking spaces per yes. thousand in industrial and the 3.5 parking spaces per thousand in business park, is that an industrial standard? Where did those numbers come from? What uh, generates them? Um, those were just suggested um, by the applicant and we were looking at their expertise in this field of what um, you know they've they've seen in their parks um, not only in this county but in other jurisdictions as well and they thought were good standards to move forward um, planning's intent for the future work program is to actually do a more in-depth study on parking requirements countywide we just have not had the opportunity to do that with these code revisions okay, at so this don't time. dig into it further Correct. We Thank will be you. definitely looking into it further. So again, these can be found on our carolrezoning.org um, as far as the links to the proposals and everything is outlined here. The highlighted is the new proposal um, and underlined is new language. So again, the request is just to move to a public hearing and this would be what the public hearing would be based on. And then after that, you have the ability to make changes to the code as you see based on public comment and other issues you want to bring forward. This went to um, Planning Commission in discussion. Correct. Before coming up here. Um, <coughs> was it just one work session? Was yeah, it two work sessions with Planning Commission, session. fairly in depth, yes. It looks it. That's why I'm saying it, it, looks, it looks good. It, there's a lot of good information in there, um, good recommended changes making the most and most efficient use out of the space that is uh you know that's con being considered because there's only one so we know it um, just for that one now the other do apply, apply more broadly to the industrial right. district right. and the c3 district right. just just to be clear on that so that just that one provision yeah. okay good make the motion board commissioners Proceed to public hearing on the proposed text amendments to the I-1 and C-3 districts as recommended by the Planning Zoning Commission. I'll second. second. Okay, got a couple seconds. Any discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you very much. Okay, let's talk about renewing Microsoft 365 and Exchange subscriptions. I'm against it. Yes. Hey, Chris, there's still nobody on the phone, right? That is correct. No one's on the line. Okay, thank you. Okay. Good morning, Commissioners. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. 
Okay, the Office of Procurement and Cooperation with Technology Services requests your approval to award the renewal of the Microsoft 365 and Exchange subscriptions to SHI International in the amount of $206,878.56. This purchase being made through a Maryland state contract. The purchase amount is within the adopted budget and no additional funds will be necessary. In October 2018, the county began implementing the transition from Microsoft Email Server and Microsoft Office 2010, which was reaching end of support life to a cloud-based subscription service. Having this service ensures that all users have the most current version of the software to protect against cybersecurity attacks and provide access to the most current features. Well, I'll make the motion. Board of Commissioners approved the renewal of Microsoft Office 365 and exchange subscriptions to SHI International in the amount of $206,878.56. Second. Got a motion, I got a second. Just a, again, a reminder, continuing to the community, these seem like very large amounts. They are budgeted and they're gone through the budget process. And we are at this time executing what we have uh, budgeted and put into allocation. So this is not just hey, let's buy a new thing. <laughs> because sometimes people think, oh, here's this and here's it. No, these are budget and I appreciate. Um, so that line saying the purchase amount is within that budget and no additional funds will be necessary is something that we up here like to see all the time. So appreciate that. Okay, with that said, all in favor? Aye. All right. Let's talk about Judicial Dialogue Software Maintenance and Support Renewal. The Office of Procurement and Cooperation with Technology Services requests your approval to award the renewal of the Judicial Dialogue Software Maintenance and Supports to Judicial Dialogue Systems in the amount of $29,457.97. This amount is approved in the FY23 budget and no additional funds should be required. The Judicial Dialogue System was purchased in FY16 for $220,830 replacing an end-of-life case file system for the state's attorney's office. The judicial dialogue system accommodates the district court and juvenile courts and allows interoperable data exchange with Maryland electronics court system. So it's, this is the Maryland standard, is what you're saying? Mm -hmm. this, uh, this is the standard equipment that can be shared yes. across yes. the jurisdictions and the state. Okay, good. I'll move the Board of Commissioners renew the Judicial Dialogue Software Maintenance Support to Judicial Dialogue Systems in a amount not to exceed $29,459.97. $57. What's that? $57. What did I say? $457.97. There you go. <laughs> okay. Happy. Okay. okay. Just you gave them two extra dollars here. I don't want to do that. <laughs> Blow <Okay>. the budget. <laughs> Discussion. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Mark, you shouldn't be so loud. Okay. Okay. <laughs> Have a good day, Commissioners. Thank, Thank you. you. Okay, Thank you very you much, go. Mr. Ripper. Let's talk about pipelining on Georgetown Boulevard. Oh, fun. Absolutely. <laughs> really. Good morning, Commissioners. Good morning. Good morning. The Office of Procurement and Cooperation with the Bureau of Roads Operation requests your approval to use an existing term contract with Pleasant's Construction to put in a full circumference lining on a pipe on Georgetown Boulevard and Lee Lane in the amount of $187,936.71. This amount is within the approved budget and no additional funds should be necessary. Okay, so uh, we had sent a couple pictures up. I don't know if Chris can bring those up for us, but um, we evaluated the storm drain pipes on Georgetown Boulevard at the intersection of Lee Lane. Uh, the first pipe here is uh, three feet in diameter, 36 inch by 397 feet long, has multiple areas, uh, again, where the bottom of the pipe has rusted out. We've shown some of these to you all before. It's created large areas of erosion and we're starting to notice some dipping in the road area above. Unfortunately, as our infrastructure gets older around the county, this continues to happen, but we are lucky uh, to have the ability to go in and do this type of a process without having to tear up the entire road. So uh, because of the length of this pipe uh, and the project itself is very labor intensive, uh, we need to clean that out manually and these voids in the ground will be uh, filled then uh, with concrete uh, prior to the lining being installed. 
and they'll also remove about 20 feet of the pipe uh, because one section uh, has dropped almost 10 inches and insert a, a new section to allow for a smooth and finished product once we're done. Uh, the total cost, as was said, is 187 93671 And uh, Jim has uh, site-specific information if you all have any other questions. No. I'll I make, guess, go know, ahead. I'll, I'll, so it's south of 26. I was just looking at where Lee Lane crossed Georgetown. Yes. Uh, I'm very familiar with Georgetown. Um, are you going to be shutting down that corner? Um, it would be that, that D-cell lane right yeah. there at the intersection, yes. In Georgetown. Yes. Okay. Yes. Which might impact the other lane coming up towards towards Lures Lane also. So just at that intersection. Lures Lures going northbound. Yep. So um, how long is this going to take? That Project? that could should only take. It, well, it's going to take a couple of days just for the excavation of it. Ref, yeah. But then once that's done, the lining should only do it should only take less than a day. Okay. Yeah. So I would have to. I'd venture to say at least three days. Yeah. Okay. And it will remain open the entire time. We'll just yeah. have a traffic control just around have here. Flag or force or yep. something. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Thanks. Wow. Why did I just have a quick question? Why does this say full circumference lining? Don't we do a full circumference lining every time we line the pipes? No, we don't. No. Hmm. Depends Not, on. <laughs> it, it depends on the the condition and the structure of the pipe because obviously the it, we don't do it when it's not necessary it's more expensive uh, but as, if the pipe itself has become structurally deficient all the way around and in this case voids underneath then we need to rebuild that structure if we have still structure existing and in which we do have in a lot of our pipes where the top portion has not rusted out then it's almost like 50 yes. percent of the pipe is done where we'll come up and meet it on the sides that keeps the structure intact and takes care of any voids that would have occurred underneath yes. I think this is the first full circumference relining I've, I've well, seen. this this process is a full circumference lining because it's that's the only way you can do it with the uh, cure in place lining right okay. yeah. the other one with the pro shot right. is the concrete, concrete. that's right. a different process right. okay good question thank you I'll make the motion board of commissioners approved to put in the full circumference lining on a pipe on Jordan South Boulevard Boulevard in the amount of one hundred eighty-seven thousand nine hundred thirty-six dollars and seventy-one cents. Got a motion, guys. Second. I never get a good question from Mr. Brown, but that's okay. All in favor? All right. Aye. Aye. Okay. Yes, step up. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner. Thank you. Have a great day. Have a good day. I guess you Absolutely. just have to work harder, huh? Oh my. That picture of Maureen, come on up here and uh, save me a little bit. Relocate Meadow Branch Road. And Mark. Good morning, sir. Good morning, Commissioners. Good morning. Good morning. Commissioners. The Office of Procurement, in cooperation with the Carroll County Regional Airport, requests your approval to award a contract for the relocation of Meadow Branch Road to Allen Myers MD Incorporated in the amount of $2,540,000. The Office of Procurement, in conjunction with Delta Airport consultants, advertised for bids and received four responses, as you can see the list below on your briefing paper. Um, so if you have any questions about the project itself, I will turn it over to Mark. Does this mean I have to update my GPS? <laughs> Just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, <laughs> a big difference between... Uh, C.J. Miller and uh, Alvin Myers. Yes, sir. Million bucks. Yeah. Yes, sir. Wow. And C.J.'s right next door. I know. Oh, to he's, the project. He's literally right there, yes, sir. Well, well, but also probably busy man. Mm -hmm. So, you know, you can only take what you can do. So, okay. I'll make the motion of the board of commissioners award a contract for relocation of Meadow Branch Road to Alan Myers, Mar Maryland. Incorporated in the amount of two million five hundred forty-five thousand dollars. Do sir. we own that road, where, the property where it's going to be relocated to? Yes, sir. We, we we've acquired all the property we need to okay. move, the, move the road. Yeah. Yes, sir. Okay. And easements. In that case, second. No. No, we didn't. Did, okay. did you second it, Eric? Okay. Yes, yes yeah. sir. Okay. Got a motion and a second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you, commissioners. Security services for Charles Carroll Community Center. Good 
Good morning, commissioners. We're here today to request your approval for the security service for the Charles Carroll Community Center. We're requesting that the award go to Marathon Technology Solutions, who is currently one of our existing term contractors in the amount of $53,155.56. This amount is within the proposed budget and no additional funds will be necessary. This is not a change order. This is a no, sir. ongoing development. Yes. Okay. Um, no additional funds. Yeah, no additional. What what other activities can be taken after this now? So we got, you know, the work that's being done. Now we got the security. Or what other expectations for Charles Carroll should we have as far as um, additional costs? We're currently working on change order analysis for future potential change orders. Right now, we are well within the budget for the project, but we're still a few months out to completion. So we just want to make sure that we don't have any unanticipated costs above and beyond our budget. Which I absolutely appreciate, but saying change order analysis to look at change orders kind of scare me though so but. it's maybe my terminology of how I <laughs> how I put that <laughs> um, but yet yeah, we're, we're just recently going through an analysis yeah. of where we yeah. are I get it where we expect we may be right uh, over the next four to five months mm -hmm. okay great are all our landscaping expenditures covered in the budget as well all right yes, yes. what is the life safety network panel <coughs> just quick I mean I just I haven't heard of that before I know about cameras and card readers and door contacts but it's part of the uh, fire alarm system okay. that is integral to the overall uh, alarm system for the building okay that makes sense then okay cool yeah all this was coordinated with IT um, we thought that Sixton was going to be here today to help with any you know, questions <laughs> that maybe was in his, uh, his purview. His purview there, but uh, but yeah. No, nope. perfect. You all are doing great. Thank you. So. Thank you, sir. I make the motion to board of commissioners um, award the contract for security systems of the Charles Carroll Community Center to Marathon Technology Solutions in the amount of fifty three thousand one hundred fifty five dollars and fifty six cents. No. Sec. Say that number one more time. Fifty-three thousand one hundred fifty-five dollars and fifty-six cents. Okay. Second. Why did I? In favor. I Aye. Is it one hundred and five dollars? <laughs> I? I think we all do did it. I Weaver that I one. I do it every now and then. <laughs> okay. Keep up. <laughs> Let's stay on uh, Charles Carroll with Skyline Solutions. This request is being made to award a contract to Skyline Solutions, the amount of fifty-nine thousand two hundred eighty-six dollars and thirty-six cents. Skyline is one of our existing term contractors. This contract will include the hardware for five, five years of licensing and labor to install and configure network switches and routers as well as wireless access points. This amount is also within the proposed budget. No additional funds will be necessary. They both kind of work together mm -hmm. with each other. So if Marathon steps in and Skyline steps in, and does the wireless signal where they're going to be pinging off the signal off of the tower over at the sports complex right by John Owings Road. So I'll move the Board of Commissioners award the contract for the uh, connection services to Skyline Solutions in the amount of $59,286.36. Second. Very well said. I don't have said. to repeat it. Okay. <laughs> Any discussion? Seen here none. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay. Thank you, Commissioners, for your Absolutely. time. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you. Chris, is there anyone on the line? No one on the line. Okay. Do we have anybody for public comment? Okay. Do, do me a favor. Um, just there's orange cards. Okay. Yeah, I know, but there's orange cards back there. I think. Fill it out afterwards. Sure. No problem. Just. Uh, so the gentleman that you gave the proclamation to, he left it here sitting on the chair. I think it's kind of important, so I think you might want to pick that I'm up. So, I'm sorry, what? Proclamation. The proclamation is the gentleman left it here. We'll get it. Okay, yeah, thanks. Thank thanks, you. cool. I guess he didn't really want it. Uh, 
Thank you. Thank you. Good seeing you. My name is Bill McCormick. I'm a Carroll County resident. I live at 5685 Rhonda Road in Eldersburg. I am here today to speak about a planned commercial center development that the Board of Zoning Appeals recently approved on Liberty Road in Eldersburg. The property was rezoned in 2019 to commercial medium, which allows for a planned commercial center as a principal permitted use. The developer applied for a two building, two story development and includes first floor commercial space and 34 second story residential units. This approval reversed an earlier, den earlier denial, a denial properly decided by the Planning Commission. That denial was rightfully based on concerns over traffic and lack of compatibility with the residential neighborhood next door where I live. I know you all know this, I'm just kind of restating it so we're all on the same page here. I'm here today to ask for your help. Like developer interests that appear before you, it seems weekly, I am here to ask for a change in zoning law. In my case, I am here to ask for changes that will protect my neighborhood and the many other existing residential communities next to land now approved for planned commercial centers. You may not know that there are many people in our county who view this particular use as detrimental to the county. There are some that have even said that the previous planned commercial center was a mistake. That includes at least one member of the planning department and even our own state delegate. And it includes many, many voting citizens who view this as particular use as a mistake. For this reason, I ask you to rescind the planned commercial center as a principal permitted use entirely from all commercial districts. I make this request on behalf of myself and my neighbors as the only way to truly protect our neighborhoods. You alone control the zoning standards that determine what can and cannot be built around us. When you adopted the most recent master plan in 2019, you enabled incompatible development to come to us. This decision was unfair to the many people who long ago decided to move here based on an existing quality of life. Me, my neighbors, and many other people in this county who now live next to property in this new commercial zone have invested our savings in our home and ourselves in this community. We ask that you now protect our quality of life and our investments from the adverse impacts that will result from your 2019 decision to bring traffic, lighting, commercial building, massing, and noise to our neighborhood. Do what is fair. Reversing the zoning changes that threaten our neighborhoods, our communities, and our quality of life. Again, I would like to state that I have never, ever been against smart, measured growth and never argued against any plan development prior to adoption of the current master plan. I believe this to be a fair and equitable compromise that does not detract from your desired commercial tax base. Section 158.134 of the Zoning Code allows any person to petition the commissioners for a change in zoning text amendments. It also includes a requirement that all proposed amendments to the Zoning Code be referred to the Planning Commission, and I am here to ask you all to do that today. Okay, um, I know you're on a three minute clock and you read, don't worry about that. You, you read your script we have with you. Is there anything else you'd like to share with us? Nope, that's it. Okay, yep, thank you very thank much. Thank you. Will you refer this to the Planning Commission? Yeah. Well, will the Planning Commission, you're asking, will the Planning Commission get this? I'm asking you to refer the changes that I proposed to the Planning Commission as outlined in the code. Okay, but what we will do is take your comments and also what you wrote under consideration, okay? And I will share with you that I will work with our staff at that point, but that's kind of where I'm at right now. If anybody else wants to share something that they've either said in other correspondence, uh, they may do so, but that's, you know, where I'm at, so, okay? Okay. And, so and feel free to reach out anytime. Okay. So the answer is that you won't refer it to the planning commission. The answer is I'm not going to get into a dialogue during this open comment. Okay. No, it, right. it's, but we'll, you know, I will address this. This is okay. not a dead issue, and it will continue to be addressed. Okay. okay. Thank you. Okay. Okay. Is there anything for open admin? I have a couple things. Um, very, they're all related. Uh, the. Um, so when uh, Rob Burke left, we appointed Jenny Hobbs as acting tax collector. Um, now that she has uh, been appointed full 
um, yeah. comptroller uh, not acting, uh, we haven't sort of crossed that T. So I uh, ask that the board appoint her as both comptroller and, and um, tax collector instead of acting in both capacities. Do we need a motion to do that? Just, yeah, might as well. Okay. So moved. Second. Right. Okay. Any discussion then? She is no longer acting. There you She's go. She's full fledged. So that, that was it for me. Okay. Anything else for open admin? Okay. <coughs> Wanda, one, you come on up. Okay. A reminder to the community that Monday, October 10th, in observance of Columbus Day, the Carroll County Government offices will be closed. On Tuesday, October 11th, there will be a joint board ESAC meeting uh, held in room 103 downstairs at 3 p.m. At 7 p.m. Um, 003. I apologize, room 003. At 7 p.m. on October 11th, there's an Ag Center board banquet and meeting that I will be attending along with Commissioner Boucher. Wednesday, October 12th, is Maryland Association of Counties Initiative Subcommittee meeting that I will be participating in, and then a legislative subcommittee meeting with MACO that Commissioner Wentz will be participating in. At 4.30 p.m., there's an adult drug court graduation that Commissioner Boucher, Frazier, Wentz, and I will be attending over at the community college. On Thursday, a question on Wednesday, isn't it Wednesday evening uh, board of ed meeting as well? What's that? Yeah, I thought Wednesday the 12th was a board of ed meeting. Maybe I'm wrong. I don't have my calendar in front of me, but I thought it was. I can look into that. Yeah, see if that is because that starts at five, I believe. So I, I would try to, I'll try to get to, the, I'll go to drug court and then I have to leave. If, if That's what you did last time. Yeah, I and I just yeah. have, to, have to leave, but I'm pretty sure it's the same night. Okay, on Thursday, we are scheduled to uh, start open session at 9 in the morning. Talk about willow pond tree planting. Okay. Um, environmental Compliance Engineering Services, final legislative legislation review, and comprehensive rezoning text amendment for ag and conservation districts, approved transfer, transfers, for community self-help to fall 2022, Reckon Park self-help projects. There'll be a land acquisition, purchasing of the ARC easements, approval to accept a grant from the MAA for the repairs and re recoding of the FBO, what is that? Field-based operator. Field-based operator, roof. Storm water drain pipe and on Lepo Road. Funds transferred to Circuit Court building. It's a bi directional amplifier <laughs> distributed antenna system. Okay. In building, oh, now that we transfer the money, we will buy it. Uh, buy it. The in building bi directional amplifier dist distributed antenna system. And then we'll talk about purchasing medical supplies for the Department of Fire EMS. So the third item, the final legislative review, is coming will come off because we had hoped to do that today in, in an afternoon work session today, but because Commissioner Wance isn't here, we pushed the work session off till next week. Okay. And then it'll be the following week when you have the final. Okay. Um. Yep, 1 p.m. we'll do the uh, work session for Ag and Conservation Districts. At 2 p.m. we have the uh, MDOT CTP Fall Tour Meeting. At 6.30 p.m. Carroll County Land Trust Annual Dinner Meeting. Commissioner Boucher and Weaver will be attending at the Best Western. Friday, nothing scheduled. Saturday, nothing scheduled. Sunday, Commissioner Frazier has a podcast. And Commissioner Wance will be attending the Celebrating America Ice Cream Social at the Farm Museum. Um, put me down for that as well. I okay. typically attend that. Uh, I apologize. Nope. Don't put me down for that. I will not be here. Sorry about that. <laughs> um, 
ice cream. On Monday, October 17th, the MSDE Advisory Council on Health and Physical Education Hybrid on site at Montgomery County. Commissioner Frazier is attending. Um, it's hybrid, I'll, I'll be there hybridly. Oh, <laughs> oh, I see. Okay. <laughs> Carroll County, Carroll Community College Foundation Scholarship Reception. Commissioner Frazier and Wentz will be attending that on Monday afternoon. On Tuesday, there's a Chamber of Commerce breakfast. That's 2BD as far as destination. Commissioner Boucher will be attending. Planning Commission. Commissioner Wentz will be uh, participating at 9 a.m. At 2 p.m., a walk in the park at Leicester Park, Hampstead. Commissioner Boucher will be participating. There will be a Veterans Advisory Meeting where Commissioner Weaver will be attending. I will not be here on the 18th. Okay. On Wednesday the 19th, the Community College Board of Trustees meeting, Commissioner Wentz will be attending at 5 p.m., 6 p.m. Carroll County Food Sunday 40th Anniversary, Commissioner Boucher, Frazier, Wentz, and I will be attending. Uh, there will be an ESEC meeting with Commissioner Wentz, uh, participating in that at 7 p.m. On Thursday, October 20th, open session. Amendments to Chapter 34, uh, public hearing. Amendments to Chapter 34, Ethics Ordinance. Environmental Advisory Council documents, EAC documents. Uh, Mr. Hine will be presenting to us. Uh, option, option to purchase <coughs> for the Rudolph and Nancy Haney property uh, through the Rural Legacy Program. It's always good stuff. Adoption of changes to Chapter 155 are scheduled. Adoption of changes to Chapter 158 are also scheduled at the time. Rezoning Case 226, the Max Sweet property. Rezoning Case 227, the MJY Investments property. Adoption of Comprehensive Rezoning Text Amendment Agricultural and Conservation Districts is then scheduled. Fiscal Year 23 CIP Budget Transfer for Carroll County Public Schools Board of Education. And then the FY23 CIP Budget Adjustments for Carroll County Public Schools, once they've been transferred, will be presenting. At 1 p.m., we have uh, consideration of bond sale award resolution, and our comptroller, Ms. Jenny Hobbs, will be presenting. Um, 3 p.m., Carroll Community College CDL program uh, ribbon cutting that all five of us will be. Uh, yeah, take take uh, my name off of that. All four of us, besides <laughs> Commissioner, Frank, <laughs> Commissioner Boucher, Whit Wance Weaver, and I will be attending. Um, on Friday, Baltimore Metropolitan Council Board of Directors meeting. Commissioner Wance will be attending in the morning. Saturday morning um, is a ribbon cutting on October 22nd. The Major General Linda L. Singh, Ray in his center, uh, naming and ribbon cutting down Sykesville, where I'll be attending. And then on Sunday, Commissioner Boucher has the podcast. Any questions? The 13th, that you canceled the workshop, right? No. No. That's, that's when happening. we're having it. Hmm? That's happening in the afternoon. I may not be there. I have a <laughs> 30 downstairs. I'll have to look and see that. We'll, let's take it's a look. It's taking at. Vivian forever to get this other one together, so okay, I can come in late. Well, well let's we, let's take a look at what the well, we deal postponed is. it from today because okay. of the wind. So, so we're really trying to get everyone there. Well, we'll we'll, we'll, we'll work it. Yeah. Um, okay, I need a motion to adjourn. So moved. Second. I got a motion and a second. All in favor. Aye. Aye. Okay, Chris, let us know when we're off. Let's